acid folding. And uh, while you may not do nucleic acids in your research, my goal was to uh, prepare a talk that anyone could take something away from. And uh, I'll hit some very general physics points as we go. I'll uh, start with an introduction on what nucleic acids are and our models. And then we'll model some riboswitches to convince you that uh, biological systems can be modeled by secondary structure. And then we'll talk about two particular problems that I worked on involving lifetimes of metastable structures and a new Arrhenius transition model, which is, uh, which is useful in systems with important intermediates. So let me just start by telling you what a nucleic acid is. Uh, it is a polymer constructed of... And there's a pointer, those sticks over there. You want to pull it yes. uh, It is a polymer that has a sugar backbone, that's these little pentagons, that are connected by phosphates, and there is a nucleobase on each sugar. And the nucleobase may bind to other nucleobases, uh, as you see here. We'll talk more about that later. The only difference between DNA and RNA is this little hydroxyl group you see on each sugar. So DNA does not have the hydroxyl, RNA has the hydroxyl. Now, biologically, they serve very different functions, which we will talk about in a bit. Uh, so I'll start with some physical properties of these things. And uh, these have been rounded heavily to, uh, to suit a kind of back of the envelope feel. Uh, the persistence length of single-stranded DNA or RNA is about one nucleotide. It's very, very short. And uh, when you bind it to another, uh, to another piece of complementary DNA or RNA, that persistence length becomes a lot longer. Uh, they're, they're quite stiff at that point. They're all chiral molecules with a distinct 5' prime and 3' prime end, as was diagrammed here. So it starts off with a what we call 5' prime end. So you see an exposed phosphate but there's no exposed phosphate on the three prime end. Uh, the radius at the phosphate backbone is about one nanometer. They're, they're very small. And the helical rise per base pair, so if I add, or base or base pair, so if I add one more base to the chain, if they become about two angstroms longer, three angstroms longer if they're double-stranded. The uh, single-stranded DNAs and RNAs, as you might expect, are very well approximated by polymer, polymer models. Uh, actually, on some scale, the double-stranded ones are also. But the double-stranded DNA forms a B-form helix, and the double-stranded RNA forms an A-form helix. And they look something like this. So if you imagine the inside of your paper towel roll is kind of disassembled, you have an A-form helix. And if you imagine taking like a piece of ribbon and just twisting it, a little bit off center, you get a B-form helix. Uh, incidentally, the real difference between these is just uh, is is just the distance between the major and minor grooves or the length of a of a bond. Um, you can imagine kind of continuously changing an A-form helix into a B-form helix just by moving these uh, these inner these major and minor grooves. Uh, the primary structure of the polymer is just the genetic code. Uh, in fact, it's the, complementary, the complementarity of these uh, polymers that gives a nice mechanism for uh, making copies of your genome. The bases on your DNA are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And they correspond respectively on uh, your messenger RNA to adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. So thymine becomes uracil. Incidentally, uracil is willing to bind with both adenine, or it can also produce a base pair with guanine, which is not shown here. Uh, so here's, again, your canonical base pairs AU, CG, uh, and AT. Uh, UG is an option that comes up sometimes. Uh, secondary structure can be represented in several different ways. So here's three different ways of looking at the same secondary structure. This is a particular uh, example that we like, which is the actimer of an XPT riboswitch, which we'll talk about more in a bit. Uh, secondary structure has a very nice division of a problem. Namely, if you produce a base pair, so uh, here is a base pair. These blue lines represent base pairs and pairs of matched parentheses. 
represent base pairs. Uh, in a well-formed secondary structure, base is interior to a base pair, pair only interior, and base is exterior, pair only exterior. Um, yes, so these parentheses match up to the, to the rainbows, and it forms these lovely stems and loops. And these stems and loops can produce functional uh, structures. So on the topic of the XPT aptamer, here is the tertiary structure of the XPT aptamer. So you, if you imagine uh, this ribose switch produces this secondary structure that can then kind of fold up and produce a detector. So in here, at that little A, uh, that is a uh, purine, uh, that is a, a purine molecule kind of trapped in that binding pocket, which stabilizes the aptamer more. An aptamer is just a detector made out of, uh, made out of RNA. Uh, the tertiary structure is concerned, by the way, about, uh, about this, not only the three-dimensional conformation of the, of the polymer in space, but also any binding to proteins or other molecules. Um, it's usually studied using molecular dynamics, which is a pretty expensive way of looking at the problem. We like to look at the simplified secondary structure models, not only because they're faster, but uh, physics is a reductionist uh, field. We would like to, to say more about these molecules with less. So switching gears to biology a little bit, I wanted to talk about the central dogma of molecular biology, lovely picture, picture I took from Wikipedia. Uh, your, the story begins with DNA. Uh, from which is transcribed your messenger RNA. So genes are read off and made into uh, a single-stranded bit that is then fed into the ribosome and translated into a protein uh, in, uh, in triplets. So three nucleotides at a time, your messenger RNA becomes, uh, becomes peptides on a protein. The roles that I'm going to talk about today are outside of the central dogma. Uh, though they may occur at either the time of transcription or translation, they're not in this picture. They're peripheral roles of nucleic acids. Uh, also important is the energy model. Like, so we, te we have some uh, secondary structures of nucleic acids, and we want to know how much energy is, uh, what the free energy of this structure is. So uh, we've got s a model that gives piecewise energies of little bits, and we just add them up to get the energy of the entire thing. Uh, the little bits that we get are hairpin loops, bulges, internal loops, dangles, which occur where the stems meet the loops, and stacks, which occur uh, within the stems, four nucleotides at a time. Uh, a multi-loop is, is another type that is not starred. Uh, in particular, we use the energy models of Santa Lucia and Turner. Santa Lucia we use for DNA, and Turner we use for RNA, though in principle we could pick up uh, any chemist's uh, energy model and apply that in the same way. So when we apply this, we have, uh, we have two calculations that we we'll use most extensively. Uh, one that we use to find the minimum free energy structure of a RNA. Uh, the algorithm here is a dynamic programming algorithm which implies that we have overlapping subproblems. Uh, in particular, remember when I told you that the secondary structure of a uh, nucleic acid divides the problem so that each pair requires that things interior pair interior and things exterior pair exterior. That's why this dynamic progr programming algorithm works. If you break that rule, and that can happen in nucleic acids sometimes, uh, this algorithm is no longer effective. There are two basis cases, then. One is that, given a subsequence, ij, you can have two substructures that form, uh, that add up to give you the minimum free energy structure. So in this case, it would be the, the substructure from i to k, and from k plus 1 to j. So there you have that. Or i and j could be paired, and then everything interior could form some substructure that uh, provides the minimum, minimum free energy of the global structure. So here's IJ pair plus the MFE structure of whatever's inside. So overlapping subproblems have saved the day. Uh, also important to us 
is the Gillespie algorithm. Uh, in the Gillespie algorithm, we need a rate model first. So we like to use the Kawasaki rate model uh, as opposed to the Metropolis rule, which you may be familiar with. Uh, the nice thing about the Kawasaki rule is that uh, there's no piecewise component of it. It's just um, rate is proportional to e to the negative del g over 2rt. So that differs, or 2 is what differs, really. Uh, then you have some statistical weight to go to each neighboring state. So in this case, I've got g1, g2, and g3. Each have their own statistical weight given by Kawasaki. So I select one by its weight. And then Gillespie says that the time I spend, I dwell at the start state before I end up at my destination is from an exponential distribution with average 1 over the sum of these rates. It remains to be said what these elementary moves were that allowed me to go from some start state to some end state. Well, here they are. So if I imagine I start at some secondary structure, there are three things I can do. I can add a new pair to my secondary structure, red. I can remove an existing pair, or I can take one pair and just change the partners of one of the nucleotides to a different one. So it kind of slides. So that brings me to the three take-home points that I hope everyone will be able to walk out of this room and say with confidence. One, that secondary structure models can model the behavior of biological systems. Second, that on complicated energy lands landscapes, high energy pathways can have a substantial effect on the lifetimes of states. It's not always okay just to consider the saddle point when you're talking about a first passage process. And third, that the Metropolis and Kawasaki rules may not be appropriate in systems with important intermediates. And uh, I will define later what an important, an important intermediate might be. Uh, so let me start by going over what a riboswitch is. Uh, the most essential part of a riboswitch is the aptamer, which is just a detector made out of RNA. So in this case, here's our XPT aptamer from before. The XPT aptamer is a detector for a purine. And it uh, lets the organism know whether or not there was some purine solution, and it might do something to the gene later based on whether or not that purine was there. Uh, Here's a diagram of what might happen if the aptamer is bound. So if the aptamer binds its ligand, uh, it will be stable. And then it won't, it, because of its stability, this P1 stem you see here will not be parasitized by an anti-terminator. So here's the anti-terminator if it formed in red. Here it is if it didn't form. If the anti-terminator was not allowed to form, it's just a biological nut switch, the terminator was allowed to form and will turn off transcription of the gene. In other words, if purine is already net, uh, present in solution, then we don't need whatever gene we were going to transcribe. Uh, if the aptamer was not stabilized, however, here's the P2 and P3 stems, but the P1 is gone, the anti-terminator could form, and by virtue of its existence, the terminator could not form. So uh, we needed a control and experimental group from the central dogma of molecular biology before we could actually evaluate whether or not these secondary structure models worked. And we felt that the TPP riboswitch provided both a control group and an experimental group in its own right. And here's how. Some TPP riboswitches uh, exist that work at the time of transcription. They're under a time constraint to form quickly to turn off transcription of the gene because, uh, of course, while the gene is being transcribed, the RNA polymerase is kind of chugging along. If the terminator doesn't form by the time the RNA polymerase gets past the terminator, it's not going to work. The gene will transcribe just fine and it will work just fine no matter what happens. Some of the TPP riboswitches, however, exist uh, with a different kind of uh, expression platform. Uh, in this case, the expression platform was the terminator. It was the, it was the part of the switch that actually did something. Uh, sometimes you have something called a sequesterer that, where the hairpin blocks a ribosomal binding site. If the ribosome can't stick to your gene, it can't translate your gene, no protein. So uh, the ones with the sequesterers then 
were not under this time constraint to fold quickly. They were allowed to thermodynamically select their most stable state in the cytoplasm, take the, all the time in the world, and then they would act later. So then we hoped to see that the, uh, the transcriptional terminators would form quickly, and uh, the sequester hairpins could take all the time they, uh, they felt like. Uh, we're going to see three different types of data coming up. Uh, I just want to clarify between the three because it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, first is a folding fraction F. So if we have a particular trial, uh, one simulation will give us a folding fraction F, which is just the fraction of the MFE structure, minimum free energy, remember from our, our dynamic programming algorithm that came in one trial. If you uh, find out how many of these Perform, uh, performed well, and well will be defined in just a second, for a particular sequence, then you have the overall folding efficiency, E, which is a property of the sequence. Then we have a population of sequences, and we can draw our, our conclusions from the efficiencies of populations of sequesterer and terminator sequences. And here are our results. Uh, in the inset, we have the probability of getting a, particularly, a particular folding fraction, this is a histogram, for some fraction of the minimum free energy structure for row independent terminators versus Shine Delgarno sequesterers. So red is the sequesterer, black is the terminator. Uh, as you can see, folding well was kind of an all or nothing process. You f it's, it seems like you either got most or all of your minimum free energy structure or you got none of it at all. As you can see, it was uh, we frequently got none of it at all for the Shine Delgarno sequesterers, and almost never for the row independent terminators. Whereas on the other side, you see almost all of the terminators folded very, very well in the trials. But the trials weren't were what's important. The efficiencies are what's important, and that's what's on the outside. So on the outside, you see a cumulative distribution function of efficiencies for red is uh, sequesters and black is terminators again. And there is a significant difference in the efficiencies of our population of sequesters versus terminators, which always folded quite well, or quite efficiently. In fact, with a p-value of 3 times 10 to the negative 7th, the row independent terminators are evolutionarily selected for folding efficiency. And we can conclude from this study that indeed secondary structure models have given us insight on the biological function of riboswitches. So now we have uh, shown that the secondary structure models work well for the terminators. Let's see how they work for the anti-terminators. So once again, here are two comp confirmations for the XPT riboswitch. And uh, we lacked a model for uh, the actin binding the ligand. But that's okay. We can use the formation of the P1 stem as a proxy. If the ligand bound, well, then the P1 stem was stable. If the ligand wasn't bound, then it wasn't stable. And so we can try folding from post aptimer and also from pre anti terminator and find out if, when we fold it from pre anti terminator, do we get an anti terminator more frequently than a terminator? And if we, post, if we start folding post aptimer, do we get a terminator form most of the time as opposed to an anti-terminator? The answer is usually, yeah. So A is the efficiency of anti-termination. E is the efficiency of termination. And what we'd like to see is that the rival switches both are simulated to anti-terminate and terminate well. And in 14 out of 24 cases, they work just fine. Uh, sometimes they didn't anti-terminate so well. And we had one guy that seemed to like to anti-terminate when, when we wanted him to terminate, and vice versa. Still, though, we can call this a success because 14 out of 24 times, we did uh, a good job of simulating uh, the proper riboswitch function. So once again, secondary structure models have given us insight on the biological function of riboswitches. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go to my next take-home point, which involves uh, the importance of high energy pathways in uh, first passage processes. And to study this, we're going to start with a something you probably remember from high school, the Arrhenius Law. 
So it's quite simple. And uh, if you imagine the canonical ensemble, it's pretty straightforward to derive, too. Uh, rate a rate to travel from a initial state over an activated state to a stable state is just e to the negative delta g over rt, where delta g is the free energy of the activated state minus the free energy of the initial state. Well, uh, how do you determine that barrier state? Usually, people like to work with saddle points, and that was our starting point, too. So if you imagine we started in this green basin, and we wanted to get to this red basin, we would say that the activated state, the barrier, is the highest energy state that we must cross to get to the, to the basin. Uh, this is a very simplified schematic. In the general case, where there are many paths from the initial state to the final state, we would say that the saddle point is, across all paths, the lowest maximum that we must cross to get from initial to final. Uh, so there we have our barrier state in the traditional saddle point sense. I'll explain the rest of this chart in a moment. So let's see how well that works for a very, very simple example. Uh, all I want to look at is this secondary structure of a short hairpin, and I want to find out how much time it's simulated to take to go from this secondary structure to this one, two to one. So I want to start uh, in this state, cross this barrier and fall into this state. Uh, so we did just that by constraining our simulation to not visit states higher than particular, uh, than particular free energies. So on this chart down here, on the vertical, uh, we have a, a, first, a median first passage time. I, uh, this is a median first passage time. This is a first passage time for a trial. So the red plot shows you the density of trials that, that uh, were simulated to go from the uh, state two to state one at a particular time, allowing it to visit all states. So this green line uh, is what we expect our first passage time to be, our median first passage time to be. However, when we applied a constraint and said, OK, simulator, you can't go above this energy. Uh, so that's this horizontal axis. We found that when we included just the barrier state, our, sim our median first passage time was here, which is a far cry from the green line that we wanted to see. Go up another kcal per mole or so, and we were, you know, this region, we're here. We're still a far cry from our simulated first passage time. In fact, we had to go up 5 kcal per mole over the, uh, over the saddle point before we could actually si correctly simulate our first passage time. So that brings us to this schematic over here. We have a density of states. So this is the number of states. And this is the energy that these states appear at. So the red arrow is the energy of state 1. The green arrow, which is right here, is the energy of state 2. And the blue arrow is the energy of our saddle point. It looks like we had to go, let's see, from 2 to about here before we could correctly simulate the first passage time. So in other words, the high energy states were playing a huge role in the lifetime of state 2. So let's consider how we might account for those high energy pathways. What was happening? Uh, well, the answer is, of course, that our, our initial state 2 had a free energy basin around it, and that the barrier was part of it, actually an ensemble of possible states you could visit to, cro to cross from initial to final. And uh, the barrier itself, thus, had a free energy. So we want to deal not with the, uh, with the energy of a local minimum at a saddle point, but rather the free energy of an initial basin and the free energy of a barrier ridge. Our algorithm then worked something like this. We started an initial basin with a free energy here in green, and we wanted to find the lowest energy barrier ridge that we could cross in that basin. In this case, it's this purple starting state. 
So we will cross this lowest barrier ridge and enter barrier other. And then in, uh, in this first iteration of the algorithm, we will then merge the states in other, the barrier ridge, and the initial state to get a new initial state. So now our free energy of the initial state is down here. And then uh, we just want to repeat our initial algorithm, our, the, we want to repeat our algorithm again so that uh, we find the lowest barrier that we can cross from this initial state to get to another basin, which was this barrier ridge, and fall into finally our, our destination state. As we do this, we record the delta G from the initial basin to the barrier ridge, and we uh, report the Arrhenius barrier as the highest such barrier we have to cross, which in this case is from this green line to this purple line. This was quite small in comparison. Uh, there's a couple of things you'll notice about this algorithm if, you're, if you watch carefully, and one that it's not perfect. Uh, it will work better in the case where there's one major rate limiting ridge and not where you have many ridges of the same, um, of the same height, because in that case, you're no longer looking at an Arrhenius process, you're looking at a Brownian motion process because all your barriers are the same height. Uh, the results are quite encouraging. So if you take a look at the red squares, which use free energy barriers to try to describe the first passage process, versus the black circles, which use just the saddle point to look at the first energy process, we see that the predicted uh, mean, that the, sorry, that the simulated mean first passage time is much closer to an exponential in the size of the, uh, the height of the barrier. So here's the, uh, si here's the size of the barrier. Uh, the scatter for the red is much less than the scatter for the black, so we see that the, uh, that the free energy barriers work much better. Uh, you might be wondering now, was it necessary to consider the entire barrier ridge Maybe just the free energy of the basin was the important contributing factor. Or maybe the, uh, only the minimum free energy structure and the free energy of the barrier was the important factor. This is that same plot you just looked at reproduced. Again, it's the uh, mean first passage time simulated on the vertical and the calculated barrier on the horizontal. Uh, you see that, again, the red has less scatter than the black. Black has a lot of outliers. And if you consider just the free energy of the barrier or just the free energy of the basin, you're thrown way off. It's a cancellation of these two figures that leads to the improved uh, prediction of free energy barriers. So the moral of the story is that if you have an exponentially increasing density of states, that will cancel out your Boltzmann factor, which is exponentially decreasing in the energy, and then you can get contributions to lifetime of energy of order one at higher energy pathways. Or uh, your high energy pathways can have a non-trivial contribution to the state lifetime in a sufficiently complicated uh, energy landscape. Uh, nucleic acids are an example of such a system. So there's one more major point that I want to make, and that is that, uh, that in systems with important intermediates, you uh, may find that Kawasaki and Metropolis rules do not reproduce the expected behavior of a system. Uh, the system that we choose to model to show this is a front experiment on DNA hairpins, which is uh, it's, just flore uh, it, it's just a fluorescent tagging of a DNA loop. So here we have a DNA loop. The green is a fluorescent tag, and the black is a quencher. So if the quencher is close to the fluorescent tag, it will not light up when you put a laser spot on it. But if the quencher and the, and the uh, fluorescent fluorophore are far apart, then if you shine a laser on it, it will glow just fine. Um, they can use this experiment to find the opening and closing rates of the DNA hairpin loop. So, uh, this was great because it just turns, so happens that our Gillespie algorithm is really good at simulating opening and closing rates, and we can compare our um, we can compare our simulation to the experimental results. 
So the DNA hairpin looks something like this. This is the T12 hairpin. They all have the same stem, but they have different loops at the end. So in this case, we have 12 Ts in the loop. Uh, they also ran uh, the experiment with a loop of 16 Ts, 21 Ts, and 30 Ts. And they also did the same thing with 21 As. So just imagine this loop changing. Uh, on the vertical, on the left, you see the experimentally determined rate of opening and closing. Closing has closed shapes, opening has open shapes, and you have a temperature, you have inverse or temperature, or 1000 over T on the horizontal. So to the right is colder, to the left is hotter. And then on, on, the, on the other side, we have the simulated rates, um, same kind of mnemonic, and the same scale on the horizontal axis. The slope of these, li of these lines gives you negative delta H barrier. Uh, the enthalpy is given by the slopes. And we immediately see a major problem between experiment and simulation. And that is that our experiment seems to think that the closing rate goes down as temperature gets lower, whereas our uh, simulation seems to show that the closing rate gets faster as temperature gets colder. Um, or the root of the problem, really, is that we have a positive delta H barrier in the experiment and a negative delta H barrier in simulation. And this is a pretty big problem. We'd really like to reconcile that. Uh, they did the same thing, by the way, for the A21 hairpins. So. Uh, the A21 sequence is CCCAA, 21As, TTGGG. Differences, <coughs> why you see many lines here, A21 was done at different salt concentrations, whereas T was done at a constant salt concentration of 0.1 molar sodium chloride. And the same kind of story, again, we see a positive delta H barrier on the, uh, in the experiment and a negative delta H barrier in our in our simulation. So uh, how we reconcile that is the existence of an almost closed state. Uh, let's ask ourselves, what exactly are secondary structure models simulating? Well, on the vertical here, we have delta G and K cal per mole um, res with respect to uh, the completely open state, which is at zero. and uh, the number of nucleotides pair on the horizontal. So the secondary structure model was immediately closing one pair and then closing two, three, four, five, and the energy was getting more favorable as it went. It turns out that this first base pair is unequivocally, it unequivocally has a favorable enthalpy in the energy models. There's no question about it. The energy models are correct. Uh, they were calculated by melting curves, and there can be no question, really, that they wouldn't produce base pairs all that frequently if producing a base pair wasn't favorable. We propose to fix that by adding an intermediate. Uh, the intermediate does not have these two bases paired. It pays the entropic cost of bending the loop around in a circle, but lacks the enthalpic benefit of that first base pair having formed. Uh, this is a very real physical state that you have to visit before you can close a base pair, but it's something that's not present in secondary structure models because, um, well, they just don't consider proximity of, of two nucleotides to another unless they're actually paired. So, again, here's what's happening. The open chain is going to an almost closed intermediate, which is then pairing, and this is the real, is the real barrier, not this. And we propose that to fix that problem, we consider the energy of the almost closed state as having the loop contribution of the union of the, of the base pairs in, uh, in these two states, and the stack contribution of the intersection of pairs in the two states. Why did I write it this way and not just be like, well, it's bending, it's the loop energy of bending the hairpin? Well, that's because I wanted this to be general. And the most general way I can think about fixing this problem is by saying that if I'm going to make some move, any move, I'm going to have to bring the nucleotides close together before I can pair them and pay that loop cost before I can gain the stack benefits. Uh, 
the astute audience member will also notice a slight problem here. While I can take two uh, secondary structures, and I can always be guaranteed that the intersection of their pairs will be a valid secondary structure, I cannot be guaranteed that the union of the pairs will be a valid secondary structure. Uh, for example, suppose, uh, suppose I was doing a nucleotide shift. Well, that same, whichever nucleotide is shifting partners cannot simultaneously be, bear, be paired to two nucleotides. That's not valid secondary structure. Well, I assure you, I assure you that this is a physical problem, or a model problem and not a physical problem. Physically speaking, there's no problem with putting three nucleotides close to each other and asking about the entropy. In our model, however, there is a problem, and that's been solved in software. That brings us to our Arrhenius rule, which replaces the Kawasaki and Metropolis rules. I am not saying that the Kawasaki and Metropolis rules are in any way wrong. They are correct, and they would still be correct if I included this intermediate structure in the space of states that they are allowed to visit. Uh, no model ever can give you information about a state that is not modeled. So the reason we, the Arrhenius rule is preferred is because I would have to add so many more states. In fact, if I had n states available to my, sec to my polymer, I would have to add n squared new states to my Monte Carlo simulation in order to fix the Kawasaki and Metropolis rules. That just leads to prohibitive computations. The Arrhenius rule does not present that problem because I'm fixing the rate model. So all we do is take our familiar Arrhenius law and turn that into our rate to go from state I to state J. So our new rate is related to the barrier between state J and state I minus the energy of the initial. This is just the Arrhenius law rewritten. Now there's one caveat there's nothing that actually guarantees in this picture that this has to be higher energy than this. Uh, sorry, that this has to be higher energy than this or this. Nothing guarantees that. So just in case the barrier wasn't the real rate limiting step, we can use either a Kawasaki or a Metropolis cutoff. And uh, so there's our Kawasaki and there's our Metropolis rule kind of rewritten for you. In this case, we like the Kawasaki cutoff because it provides more dynamic range than the Metropolis cutoff. We think that that's why many papers have reported that they get better results with Kawasaki versus Metropolis rule. The results are quite encouraging. Here are our experimental results redrawn for you in the same way as before. Rate on the vertical, 1 over temperature on the horizontal. Uh, here's our old Kawasaki rule. And here is the T, uh, the poly T hairpins simulated with the Arrhenius rule. As you can see, this slope looks a whole lot better, closer to this than this slope does. So the Arrhenius rule has provided substantial improvement. Again, with the H21 hairpins, the uh, Arrhenius rule provides much better agreement with experiment than the Kawasaki rule. But the Arrhenius rule has removed the favorable enthalpy from the, from the barrier. Now there's one more thing you'll notice, and that's that uh, we still have this different slopes for the different salt concentrations in the poly A sequences, and the different uh, slopes have not materialized in the Arrhenius rule. And we think that is a function of sequence-dependent rigidity. Uh, if you imagine a polymer, um, even <coughs> the polymer might not like to bend all that much. And the, the degree to which it likes to bend might be a function of the sequence. Uh, in fact, this has been reported that the, that the poly A strand ha, uh, costs you about 0.5 kcal per mole to bend it before you can bring it together. So let's find out what happens when you add the sequence-dependent rigidity to, uh, to the poly A sequence. So here we are with the Kawasaki simulation with no uh, with no rigidity added. This is one you've seen before. And here's the Arrhenius model with no rigidity added. You've also seen this before. Here's what happens to Kawasaki when you add rigidity, and here's what happens to Arrhenius when you add rigidity. So as you can see, rigidity alone does not fix Kawasaki, but it brings Arrhenius looking a lot more like experiment. So we conclude uh, that 
uh, uh, first, you need to, we need, there needs to be uh, an improved energy model that takes into account sequence dependent rigidity. I actually have an interesting idea on how to do this that uh, if you ask, I'll talk about. Uh, further, we conclude that the rate constant, that's kappa, for DNA is about 10 to 100 nanoseconds for the Arrhenius model. So this is your time scale for elementary secondary structure changes on DNA. And further, we conclude that the Arrhenius rule is a better choice than Metropolis or Kawasaki rules for kinetic Monte Carlo in systems with significant intermediates. The 